Chapter 5 Grace was speechless, only able to emit a confused babbling. Tears streamed down her face. She looked at Ian, lying motionless on the floor, deathly pale as if his life quickly slipped away. Though she did not feel the same way about their relationship as he did, she had grown to care for him. Now, as she watched him dying on the colorless floor of the Hitchcock High School lunchroom, she realized that she cared for him more deeply than she thought. It was not a romantic love that she felt for him and probably never would be. However, she realized that he was the only person in this lousy school that had even attempted to befriend her. He was, essentially, her only friend in the world, and it broke her heart to see his life seeping from him. Ari reached down and touched Ian's neck, checking for a pulse. He's not dead, Ari whispered, but he's close. Has anyone called 911? I did just before the shooting started, Nephi said, standing over them. For the past few moments, she had been trying to keep the other kids back. Instead of running for their lives, as the few who Grace had grabbed on their way out had done, the bulk of them ran toward Ian's fallen body, eager to see him die. Grace saw them pushing closer, shuffling against each other to witness human suffering, and was again sickened by their behavior. Somewhere from the back of her mind welled up a fragment of a conversation between her and her Uncle Jim. He had given her a statistic that indicated a growing number of people, especially younger people, ran toward danger instead of away. The awful point he made with this statistic was that they didn't run toward the danger to help those in trouble. It was in the hopes of seeing something gruesome. She took in the wide-eyed, gore-hungry crowd. Some of the faces were filled with barely hidden glee, others with a mixture of disgust and amusement. It made Grace want to scream at them to wake up. This was not a scene from a Saturday night slasher film. This was a desperate moment where death was imminent. Ian was not a two-dimensional character. He was an extremely kind, funny, life-loving boy who had put himself in danger to save others. And with that thought, she realized that he had not been heroic just to save others. He had done it to save her. She tore her gaze from the gore-hungry mob and looked desperately at Ari. She felt a small sense of comfort creep into her as she took in Ari's strength and confidence. His dark hair fell over his eyes as he continued to keep check of Ian's pulse. He took his right hand, brushed it back, revealing a small cut on his forehead that was slightly bleeding. Can you help him? Grace asked as she wiped tears from her face. You've been hurt. Ari ignored her observation concerning his forehead, and his eyes seemed to convey that there was nothing he could do to help Ian. We can try to stop the bleeding until help arrives, he said. He set to work removing Ian's hands from the wound and assessing the damage. He removed his black leather jacket, took off his white t-shirt and handed it to Nephi, who tore a small strip from the hem. He used it to quickly clean around the wound. Grace was shocked that so much blood would seep from a hole the size of a dime. Ari folded what remained of his shirt and used it as a compress over the wound. I need you to apply pressure here, he said to Grace. Can you do that? Grace nodded, and without another thought, took both of her hands and pressed on the wad of white shirt. It immediately became soaked with Ian's blood. That's good, Ari said. They heard sirens in the background. 
He turned to Nephi. You need to get out there and tell the cops that the shooter has been subdued. Otherwise, they will set up a perimeter and won't enter the school right away. Tell them that we have two wounded, one badly, and to get paramedics in here. Nephi nodded. She turned, pushed her way through the crowd, and out the fire exit. The crowd surged closer, hungry for a gruesome show. Ari stood and put on his leather jacket. Grace looked up at him. Her tears had started to dry now that she was doing something other than reeling in desperation. Where are you going? Ari looked over his shoulder. I can't be here when the cops arrive, he said. But I need your help. Ari shook his head. There's nothing else I can do. We've slowed the bleeding and have bought him enough time for the paramedics to save him. It's going to be close, but he'll make it. Grace's heart leaped and grabbed at the small sliver of hope. But why do you have to leave? she asked. Have you been in trouble with the police? Ari again shook his head. No, I just don't want them to see me. With that cryptic statement, he turned and shoved through the crowd, leaving Grace kneeling on the floor, fraught with worry as she worked to staunch the blood pouring from the wound in Ian's chest. She closed her eyes, and for the first time that she could remember, she prayed to God for help. None of her ego was involved as she prayed. Her soul was completely laid bare with only the worry and love for another human being. She didn't pray for any reason other than that Ian was a good boy in dire need of divine assistance. She heard a deep, booming voice yelling at the mob to move out of the way. She knew it was the paramedics. She looked up and saw two men pushing through the mob of kids. One was older and bearded. He pushed a gurney while the other man carried a box full of medical supplies. They knelt beside her, the bearded man telling her she had done a good job, the younger man starting an IV in Ian's left arm. As she watched these two men working confidently and efficiently at saving her friend's life, she was suddenly overcome with a sense of calm. She was still scared more than she had ever been in her life, but there was a definite reinforcement of hope. She backed away, giving them room to work. A group of police officers were now in the lunchroom, forcing people to step back, herding them to the far side of the lunchroom so they could begin taking statements. She saw that the goth, Justin, was now in handcuffs and being escorted through the door by two burly officers. Rebecca Snyder was being attended to by another team of paramedics. She was sitting up, pale and in obvious pain, but alert and safe. Excuse me, someone said beside her. She turned and saw that Ian was now on the gurney and the bearded paramedic was asking her to step aside. She took a step back, allowing them to push by. Is he going to be okay? she asked. The bearded paramedic nodded his head. I think we got him in time. You did great by stopping the blood flow. She watched as they pushed Ian through the door and out of sight. A young, bald officer motioned for her. She walked over to him, still feeling dazed, as if she were having some horrific hallucination. The officer handed her a towel that he had gotten from somewhere. I'm Officer Jenkins. Use this to dry off your hands. Grace looked down and saw that her hands were covered in Ian's blood. She began wiping them, almost absent-mindedly, on the towel. I'll let you go to the restroom and wash yourself up, Jenkins said. Then I'll need to take a statement from you. Are you going to be okay with that? Grace nodded. She was unable to speak. She couldn't stop thinking of poor Ian. 
She turned and began to slowly walk toward the doors that led to the school's main hallway. Just outside those doors were the restrooms. As she pushed through the doors and out of the lunchroom, she caught a glimpse of Ari as he shot around the corner at the far end of the hallway. Even though she was currently distraught and overwhelmed with grief, she couldn't help herself at wondering why he was so concerned about being seen by the police. Through the blanket of her grief, there was a small but powerful steering in the back of her mind at how Ari's strange behavior only served to make him so much more mysterious. <laughs>